So here we are going to discuss enzymes and their specificity and how they fit together and how they work. So one thing to keep in mind is that enzymes have substrates, of course, and enzymes are going to be specific. However, the enzymes are specific for the type of reaction. So enzymes And so a hydrolase will always be a hydrolase. An oxoreductase will always be an oxoreductase. Now they're not always going to be specific for the substrate. So let's talk about a few examples. So an example of a specific enzyme substrate interaction is going to be succinate dehydrogenase. Its substrate is always succinate. So a non-specific enzyme substrate is going to be um, alcohol dehydrogenase. Alcohol dehydrogenase is going to be able to work off of different alcohols, methanol, ethanol, butanol. Okay, and so the enzymes don't always have to be specific for one substrate. Now, enzymes are also going to be specific for a steric conformation. And so what this means is that an enzyme that's specific for D cannot bind the L form, and vice versa. So an enzyme that's specific for an L cannot bind to a D. And there is an, always an exception in nature, and these are our race bases. And these are found in bacteria. Now, one thing to also keep in mind are isozymes. And isozymes are going to be different enzymes that are going to be able to bind the same substrate and make the same product. And, and form same product. And some examples are lactate dehydrogenase system, and usually these um, isozymes are made in different tissues. So we already talked about creatine kinase, and you have blood uh, brain form, you have a muscle form, a creatine kinase. And so for um, our lactic dehydrogenase system, um, you also have different isoforms. And so in this case, you have H for heart and M for muscle. And then depending on the different tissues, you will have different versions of these um, lactic 
um, dehydrogenase enzymes. So in both heart and kidneys, you'll have a tetramer made of just the heart version of the enzyme. In some heart kidney cells, as well as brain and red blood cells, one of those is going to be replaced with the muscle. In other cells of the brain, lung, white blood cells, you now have um, a tetramer made up of two heart and two muscle forms of lactic dehydrogenase. And then also in skeletal muscle cells, in some of them, you're going to have um, the tetramer made up of only the muscle protein. And so these isoforms, again, will all be uh, working off of lactic acid um, and pyruvate, but they are going to be a little bit different and they're made in different locations. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about enzymes and their interactions with their substrates. So with enzyme-substrate interactions, you're always going to have weak interactions. And these are going to be important because they're optimized. Um, and the substrate binding is site, the site where the substrate actually fits in the enzyme is going to be specific. So if you look, if you think back to that alcohol dehydrogenase that we talked about, alcohol dehydrogenase can work off of ethanol, methanol, butanol, but in its actual active site, the binding to each of those substrates is going to be the same. So the rest of the molecule can look different, but the portion that actually binds us to the active site will look very similar. Now there are two different models for substrate enzyme interaction. There is something that's referred to as a lock and key, which is going to use hydrophobic, electrostatic, and hydrogen bonds. And then you also have induced fit model. And this is where the enzyme changes, so it has a conformational change. And this change occurs after it's bound to the substrate. And so here we have um, glucokinase. And the substrate for glucokinase is, of course, going to be glucose. Galactose looks different than glucose, so you're going to need a different enzyme to work on galactose. You're going to need a galactokinase. I sneeze. Um, so galactose and glucose are going to need separate enzymes in order to be metabolized. Glucose will fit nicely into glucokinase, and galactose cannot fit nicely into glucokinase. So let's talk a little bit about this lock and key model in reality. So if you think about a stick, which is your substrate, this metal stick, if you have no enzyme and you want to break the stick, you're going to have to bend the stick and that is going to be the transition state because that is going to be the state that's going to be the hardest. And so we refer to the amount of ener energy, usable energy in a system to do work as Gibbs free energy or this delta G. And Gibbs free energy is going to be the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. And if this is less than zero, then this is going to be exergonic and spontaneous. If it is greater than zero, it's going to be endergonic and not spontaneous. So basically, if the reactants are favored, you're going to want to move the, the reaction forward. And if the reactants are not, um, if the product is um, um, not, is the product is not favored, then you're not going to move the reaction forward. I think I said that right. Anyways. Um, so let's just, the reaction that has the lower delta G, the reactants that have the lower delta G than the products, 
have an increase in free energy in the reaction, and so that will not be spontaneous. And not spontaneous means you have to have energy required. If the reaction is going to go from high free energy to low free energy, then you're going to move towards a negative delta G, and that will be spontaneous. And it's keeping in mind that spontaneous does not necessarily mean the reaction is going to occur because you still have to have often an initial activation energy to start the process. And so even some spontaneous reactions will need an initial energy input. Now enzymes, of course, are going to be important in affecting the transition from the substrate to the product. Um, and they're going to lower, do this by lowering the activation barrier um, or the amount of energy needed for the reaction to occur. And this is through stabilizing the transition state. So the transition state is where you need the most energy um, in order for the reaction to proceed. So enzymes are not going to affect equilibrium. They are simply going to affect the amount of energy needed to go from your substrates to your products. And the delta G is, in fact, the change in free energy. Okay, so here we have a delta G with that funny little symbol, and that is a delta G of the transition state. So you need that much energy, which is shown by this little lovely arrow, in an uncatalyzed reaction in order to go from your substrates to your products. Now, when the lock and key model, if you have the, subs the um, enzyme active site, shown here with these little green things, they call them magnets, but the enzyme active site fits the enzyme substrate complex. So you basically are going from a substrate to the enzyme substrate to the enzyme product to the product, right? And so if this enzyme substrate here is what fits into the active site, then you're going to get few products. And why is because you are basically adding this delta GM. The delta GM is basically the difference between the transition state energies of the uncatalyzed and catalyzed reaction contributed by the interactions between the stick and the um, enzyme that's binding the stick. When the enzyme is complementary to the substrate, which is shown here, the enzyme substrate binds very tightly in the active site. The enzyme substrate complex is more stable and has less free energy than the ground state. So you basically now are dipping below the substrate. And your delta GM is what the energy is required to overcome this stability with the enzyme substrate complex. And so the reason you have a few products is because not only do you have this uncatalyzed delta G free energy you have to overcome, you also now have the stability of the enzyme substrate complex. And then finally, if you have an enzyme that's going to fit the transition state, this funny little symbol up here for transition state, you are now making it easy for the enzyme um, to break the substrate into products. And so an enzyme with a pocket complementary to the transition state destabilizes the substrate and it contributes to the substrate, in this case, being broken into the products. And so basically you are now decreasing the free energy required to overcome now the lower transition state because your enzyme fits the transition state, not the substrate and not the products, but the transition state. Okay, so now for an induced fit model, you basically have the initial interactions are going to be weak, right? Because your enzyme active site 
doesn't fit the substrate well. It fits a little bit here and a little bit there, but as soon as you get binding, so you bind, then you get conformational changes. And these conformational changes are in the enzyme. And this becomes a stronger binding. So now you have a strong binding. I should put up here as weak. And the catalytic site becomes close to the substrate. Um, and then this catalytic site is brought into close proximity with the area of the substrate that's going to be changed. And this is also active site. It is close to and then you get the transition state complex. and then your reaction products will form. Now this induced fit model has basically four mechanism. You're going to have something called bond strain. And in this case, you have the enzyme substrate binding induces strain. And so your strain substrates are going to form bonds and this shifts the substrate into the transition state. And so what happens here is you're gonna have some bulky groups such as aspartate and glutamate, get forced into conformations that are going to induce this substrate bond strain. Oops. And so we have uh, bulky groups from aspartic aspartate and glutamate. And then you also have catalyst by proximity and orientation. And so here you have your enzyme and substrate interactions are going to orient your reactive groups and bring them into close proximity. So this is going to bring And this induces strain again in those bulky groups. And the strain is really is going to push or favor the bulky groups there and their participation in the chemical reaction. Now you also have catalysts that are going to be involved as proton donors and acceptors, acid bases, and these can contribute to the completion of catalytic events by strain. So for example, glutamate is a proton donor. <laughs> 
and this is used as an acid catalyst. And this is going to contribute to the catalytic event. So we had the bond strain, which you have the enzyme and substrate coming together, inducing strain, shifting to that transition state. And this is causing, uh, caused by bulky groups. And then by bringing reactive groups into close proximity, those bulky groups that are inducing that strain are going to be more likely to participate in the chemical reaction. And then the bulky groups, such as glutamate, are also acid catalysts, which will themselves contribute to the actual catalytic event. Now you also have covalent catalysts in which you have the substrate, which is going to be oriented to the active site of the enzyme, and a covalent intermediate is going to form. This is, of course, with the enzyme. And so, for example, proteolysis by serine proteases. So you have um, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and elastase, which are part of your digestive enzymes, are serine proteases. And they are going to form covalent intermediates with their um, protein um, substrates as they're cleaving them. Also, your clotting cascade enzymes are serine proteases, and serine proteases, this is blue, what this means is there is a serine in the active site. That's all it means when I say serine proteases. Okay, so now chemical reactions, so the number of molecules of a reactant converted to the product in a period of time is a reaction rate. And so the reaction rate is going to be dependent on the chemical properties, and rate constants. And K is the rate constant. And so you're going to have some substrate go to some product, and then you're going to also have the ability of that going back to the substrate. And so we're going to have a concentration of our A and we're going to have a forward reaction going to our concentration of B times the rate constant. And then we have our concentration of um, B sorry, let me write it this way um, going backwards to K which is the rate constant times the concentration of A. And then you have the K equilibrium, which is going to be K forward, which is plus one over K backwards or reverse, which is minus one. Now, one thing that always happens when you're trying to go from one substrate to a product a lot of times you need some energy from another source. And so in biology, these reactions are coupled. They're linked together. So for example, 
if you're going to go from A to B, this might have a free energy prime of plus 4 kilocalories per mole. And remember, when you have a plus, that means it's not spontaneous. So A would never become B in any situation where nothing else was contributing to that reaction. So in biologic, we use a lot of ATP to be coupled with um, interactions that are not um, exergonic. And so here we have ATP plus water becomes ADP plus an inorganic phosphate. And this has a delta G, D, G prime of a negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole. So this is very exergonic. And this is endergonic. And so what you, what you do in a system, you couple these two together. So you have A plus ATP plus H2O goes to B plus ADP plus inorganic phosphate. And this has an overall delta G of a negative 3.3 kilocalories per mole. And so now by coupling, it becomes more favorable for A to go to B. All right, so finally, let's just talk a little bit about chemical reaction orders. So the number of molecules required to form a reaction complex that is able to proceed to products. Now we have first order, and this is one substrate, one product. This is that A to B that we just discussed. You have a second order, for example. Oops. In which you have two substrates. and two products. So this is that H A B A ATP, H2O, gives you ADP plus PI plus free energy. And then the reaction order is um, based on the onset of the reaction, the initial velocity, and the point within the reaction rate that no longer when you add more substrate, you get um, your, your reaction does not proceed any faster. So if you have a first order reaction at initial stage, uh, the addition, let me separate these two just for a moment. Oops. Okay, so for a first order reaction, um, at initial stage, the addition of the substrate rapidly accelerates the rate because you're only depending on one reactant. So in the initial state, And again, because you only have one reactant here. Now, second order gets more complicated and it depends on the actual chemistry. But the other thing to note is there is something called a zero order. And a zero order is at the velocity maximum when no increase in rate with the addition of more substrate. And in this case, your enzyme is saturated. 
Okay.